very good morning to each and every one of us. We're so grateful to God for this day. So grateful to God for the gift of life. Grateful to God that we can be in the house of the Lord one more time. We do not take it for granted. Grateful to God for the day in which we are living in. We are living in a special day. We are living in an interesting time. We are living in a time when we are right on the verge on the edge of a major move of God and God has seen it fit that we be that generation and in this generation we are going to experience one of the uh, the biggest or the, the uh, yeah the biggest move of God that this world has ever encountered we've always talked about other moves of God and what God did but I believe that the the season we are in and in this generation we are going to encounter God in ways that people have never ever ever encountered it will be much bigger much greater than any of the other moves amen are you excited to be living in that generation yes my prayer and my desire is that each and every one of us will be sensitive to the speaking of God will be obedient to the instructions that God is giving us so that you will not be a spectator and you will not be hearing it is happening or God is doing but you will be right on the cutting edge that has always been my prayer that I won't hear it is happening I won't be a spectator but I will be a part of that which God is doing on the face of the earth at any given moment. Amen. If that is your desire, I want you to say amen. Amen. Um, I want us, wanted us to do a song. I don't know whether we do it. Okay. Let's do it after. We may have your seats. We will do it at the, at the very end. Because it will still be relevant even at the very, very end. We've been talking about working with God. And as I said, this is a series we are going to do for quite some time. Because there are certain things that God wants uh, to speak to us as a church. And God has been speaking to us very, very, very powerfully in the recent past. This began on the 20th of September when Pastor Robert uh, Burale said that uh, as we get into the next uh, seven years, after we, we, we completed seven years, we should not expect to see the hand or the power of God. He said the next few years, the Lord will show himself faith, uh, himself strong to those who will go to the dimension of seeing God as a friend. And I was saying that over time, there has been that drawing, there has been that sense that like God is calling us to have a closer walk with him. And I was saying that it's like God want is, has been like wanting to redefine the kind of relationship that we have uh, been having with him. And we saw uh, during the, the, the first day when we started this series of working with God is that the 
what one of the God when he was creating us one of the desires he had was to have a very very close walk and relationship with us and we saw that that is what the enemy has been fighting right from the very beginning and we were able to look at Adam and Eve and we also looked at Cain and what happened is that uh, when these people sinned, the, act, the, the, the thing that happened is that they walked out of the presence of God. That is what the enemy is always uh, uh, seeking to do. During uh, part two, we were able to look at when somebody walks close with God, heaven takes note. Because you are, living, uh, you are living differently from how everybody else is living. And we looked at the example of uh, Noah and Abraham whom God, um, no, it was Noah and Job whom God, I mean, was able to note that they were living very, very differently compared to how everybody else was living. Then in part three, last week, we said that when you walk with God, there will always be an assignment. And we were asking ourselves, what is your assignment? And we said, each one of us has an assignment. And when you talk about an assignment, I don't want you to think about pastors. I don't want you to think about being a pastor, being an apostle, being a bishop, being a prophet. We said, every one of us has an assignment wherever God has planted us. Today, we want to move on and talk about Abram. The person we know as Abraham, when we encounter him in the word of God for the first time, he is called Abram. And we want to learn a few things from how he began to walk with God because the word of God has talked about Abraham as a man who walked with God. The word of God has also talked about Abraham being a friend of God. And if you remember, that's like where we were starting. That is where Pastor Robert Burale started us, about becoming a friend of God. So I want to go back and see, where did it all begin? Where did it all begin? And I want us to read the book of Genesis, chapter 12, from verse 1 to 6, in the New King James Version. Genesis 12, 1 to 6. And this is what it says. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran verse 5 then Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people uh, whom they had acquired in Haran and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan, verse 6. Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the Terebinth tree of More, and the Canaanites were then in the land. In that portion of scripture, we are seeing the call of Abram. And it signifies a journey from the known to the unknown. Remember, he's being told to leave his father and mother. He's being told to leave his country. He's being told he's to leave his family. He's being told to leave his father's house. And then he's being told to a land I will show you. So he was not told to go to a specific place. It's not the way I can tell you, I want you to relocate from Ruaka and go to Roiro. Or I want you to relocate from the Ndegua and go to Roiro or go to Mombasa or go to the UK or go to the US. No. He was just told, leave everything and then come with me to a place I will show you. And one of the things we learn about Abraham, many people talk about uh, obedience in the life of Abraham 
This is where it began. That he was willing to obey God and walk away from what he knew. Walk into the unknown. So this signifies a journey from the known to the unknown. He was living all that he had known for the last 75 years. So this is not the way I can come to a 17 year old and tell them to leave this town and go to this town. Or the way you tell your family, we are moving from Buburuburu and then we are going to start staying in Kiambu. No, 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 no. This is somebody who had lived there for 75 years. And so, he was going to be stepping into a new beginning. He was going to be stepping into a new environment. But it is good for us to ask ourselves, where was he coming from? You know, many times we read how God called Abraham and how he obeyed and how he went. But many times we do not go back to ask ourselves, where was he coming from? Not in just in terms of location, but where was he? I mean, specifically, one of the things I have told you is that by the time when God was calling him, he was a 75-year-old man. That means he was settled. He was established. The word of God is actually telling us he had a wife. He had already started a family. He was ready to settle down. And God comes and says, Come, leave everything you have known. Come with me to a place I will show you. So where was he coming from? Let's go back to Genesis 11. Genesis 11. I want to read verse 10. It says, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and begat Aphaxad two years after the flood. Now, if you continue that genealogy, you will end up with the father of Abraham and Abraham. So one of the things we need to note is that um, Abraham came from the lineage of Shem. Who was Shem? One of the sons of who? Huh? Ati? Noah. One of the sons of Noah. And if you remember, is it last week we were talking about Noah and building the ark and how God did away with the, with, 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 I mean, with the, the, with, with the human race and only saved one family. Sawa, sawa. So it was just Noah, his wife, their, 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 their sons and their wives. So out of that genealogy of Noah, this is where uh, Abraham is coming from. A genealogy is well, like family histories or like the family tree. This one begat, this one, this one begat, this one. And many times when we get to those portions of scripture, we jump. <laughs> we do what? Who, how many people read? Take time to read every one of them. So and so begat, so and so. So and so begat so and so. So and so be, do you, how many? I want you to be very honest. How many people read? We never read those things. But let me tell you, if you begin to read those things and to study those things, you begin to understand a few things. Are we together? So, now, uh, the Jewish nation came from Shem. So, the accounts that follow make much of him and his family. So, after that, when you read that verse 10, and I have started for you, verse 10 is saying, this is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was one, 100 years old and he begot Aphaxad two years after the flood. Now, I want us to jump to verse 24. If you continue from verse 10, if you continue, so and so be God, so and so, you will continue, will continue. You come to verse 24. This is what verse 24 says. Nahor lived 29 years and begat Terah. After he begat Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begat sons and daughters. 
verse 26. Now Terah lived 70 years and begat Abram. So at what age was Abraham's father when Abram is born? 70 years. Okay? So it says, now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. Then Abram took Nahor, uh, uh, Abram and, uh, and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai and the name of Nahor's wife Milcah the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka, and the father of Iska. 30. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. So who started to go to the land of Canaan? Terah. Who was Terah? The father of Abraham. Very good students. Good. Clap for yourselves. You are following. It shows you are in church. You are not at home. So Tumefika Vazgani. 31. So let's read 31 again. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. 32. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. I'm going to go back to that verse again. So Abram was not just being called out of a physical location. Are we together? He was not being called out of what? A physical location. Where they were staying. He was not just being called out of Ur of the Chardians. It's not the way you relocate from Kenya to Uganda or Tanzania or Dubai or Kuwait or Qatar. No, it was not like just move from this country to this country. Abram was being called out of an environment. When I'm talking about an environment, I want you to think about a spiritual environment. It's good to understand this country where were they were, what kind of a country was it? Where they were staying was a city. It was a metropolitan city. And it was full of worldliness. People loved pleasure. People loved fun. It was not a city that, uh, I mean, was full of godliness. That was full of the fear of God. And so, he's not just being told to relocate. It was not just a physical relocation. But God was calling him out of an environment. He was calling him out of the things that were going on in his family. Just by reading that portion in chapter 11, you see that had Abram not been called out by God to begin a new chapter, to begin a new journey with God, there was no, I mean, there was not much that was going to come out of him. Are we together? Are we together? He was not just being called out of a physical location. He was being called out of the negative. Abram was in a negative, what do you call, an environment that had a lot of negative energy. Because when you read that portion I have read about his father and then about his brothers, 
Do you see anything significant? Oh, I'm kushikanisha. Turudi tusome tena. Eh? Can we go back and read again? Let's go back and read again. 11. Um, let's read from verse chapter 11. Let's, okay, let's just read 24 to 26, then 28 to 32. I want you to pay attention to every person and what is said about that person. Because if Abraham had not been called out of that, told to leave his family, he would not have become the person that he became. Tukwa pamoja. Haya, tusome tena. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. So Abram had how many brothers? Two. What were their names? Nahor and? So as we are reading the next portion, I want you to pay attention to what he said about Terah, the father. What he said about Naha, Nahor and what he said about Haran. Haya, verse 28. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans. So what do you get out of that? We are going to go step by step. So that we can understand what was Abraham being called out of. Huh? Premature death. That means he never inherited the father. Children, um, I mean, parents are not supposed to bury children. What is supposed to happen? Children are supposed to bury parents. So first thing there, and for the title of my message, it is uh, God wants to change your trajectory. When God calls you to walk closely with him, what does he want to do? He wants to change your tra trajectory. Because you're going to see if Abraham remained in his family, he was not, he, there was not good trajectory. There is nothing good to write home about, about the family where God was calling him. And that is why he was telling him, come out. Come out of your family. Leave your family. Leave your father and mother. Leave your environment. So the first thing we see, and Haran died before his father, Terah. You know, you know the Bible, sometimes I find the Bible very interesting. Just say he died. I mean, if you just say he died, it will be true he died. But you know, to specify before his father, Terah, that tells you something. Are we together? He died. But every detail in scripture is important. Are we together? Are we continue? Um, hmm. Verse 29. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. The name of Nahor's wife was Milka, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milka and the father of Iska. But Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law, Sarai, his son's Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. What do you see in that portion? Huh? Yes. There was something about starting and not finishing. Because when they left, where were they? Where were they going? But where did they stop? We are not told why. 
But you see, the, something about Terah's father, it is starting without finish. One time somebody said, you know that 28 we have said, uh, read, is that um, Haran died. Where? Huh? In there? In his native land of Ur. Sawa. And then, what was the name of that boy? The name of that boy was Haran. And then when they came to Haran, what happened? He died. He, he decided to live there. What does that tell you? Huh? He built his life around a tragedy. Do you remember God speaking to us in 2021? Through Pastor Musango? What did he tell us? Do not build your life around what? A tragedy. So we see the father starting a journey. It is very, very clear. I am going to place X. So it's the way you decide. You're coming from here and you're going to Mombasa. And then you decide to camp in Machakos. But where were you going? So what do you see? Starting without? Finishing. That is what Abraham was being called out of. Because that's what he... That's what the, his native family was doing. Now, 32. So the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. There's something missing. Abraham had how many brothers? How many have we heard of? How many have we heard of? One. So what happened to the other one? Huh? Kuna mtu amesema kitu na arudie. Unknown. Of you, of you. I mean, nikuwa nimesikia ni kama amesema of you, of you. He, there was no relevance. Aliishi tu. He was just enjoying oxygen. We are not told anything of what he did. Do you ever see anything he did? No. No. Now, do you see why Abraham needed to leave? Huh? Do you see why God had to come into his life and begin a journey? And that's why I was saying that when Abraham was being called, he was not just being called out of a physical environment. He was being called from an environment that was not going to add any value to him. So God wanted to bring Abraham out of everything that affected his lineage. And we have been able to identify the father was plagued with starting without finishing. Alikuwa anaanza a project lakini yafanye nini? Hamalizi. Starting without finishing. Haran, Lord's father, died without inheriting his father. And timely death. Abraham's brother Nahor was alive, but no relevance. He was just living. You know those people in scripture, you just hear their names, but you do not hear anything they did or anything they said. That is what Abraham was being called out of. So, Starting without finishing, untimely death, lack of relevance. Now, back to Abram. Abram, when he's called by God, the second thing that was happening, so we said the first thing is that he was being called into a new beginning. He was being called into a new beginning. Let's look at the second thing. The second thing that Abraham was being called into, he was entering into new promises. He was entering into new promises. 
And that is why we are saying, when God calls you and he wants to change, um, I mean, he's calling you for a close walk with him, it does not leave you the same. Some of you are being called out of things that have plagued your family. And so when God is asking you to walk with him closely, it's because there are certain things he wants to remove out of your life. There are certain things he wants to correct out of your life. And that is why sometimes we look at our families and we see things that are not okay. So you look at auntie so-and-so, uncle so-and-so, whoever is named this name, they are like this. So when God is calling you close to himself, what is he wanting to do? He is wanting to remove you out of the environment, out of the things that have plagued you. And so it is important, even as we begin to walk and to develop this intimacy with God, that we be aware that there are certain things that God is going to be dealing with in our lives. There are certain things he's going to be uprooting out of our lives. He's going to be changing our trajectory. Because if you just continue the way you are continuing, you will just end up like the rest of your relatives. Be together. These were not idol worshippers. We have seen. Were they idol worshippers? Huh? We have seen. He came from generation of who? Of Shem. But yet there were issues. His family, there were issues. And so that represents us. We are also surrounded by issues. Some of you, any business you start ends and you can't explain. Starting without finishing. Some of you, you get jobs and it just ends. You are plagued with like what we would call, when you talk about premature death, let's not just think about physical death. Some of you have started projects and they have just died. Everything you start just dies. When you are starting it, it has a lot of potential. What does that mean? You have plagued by premature death. For some of you, it is irrelevant. You are just breathing in oxygen. For lack of a better statement. What are you doing? You are just breathing oxygen. You are of no heavenly good and you are of no earthly good. Ukotu. Ask your neighbor. Are you among them? In other words, you are irrelevant. Irrelevant. If we Google your name, all we see is your picture. But there is nothing to your name. I'm not talking about Google in the real sense of the word. I'm talking about if somebody was to analyze your life. Eh? And Google so and so. The only thing that comes up is your picture. That means you are irrelevant. Can you tell your neighbor? It's time to get out of irrelevance. Yes, we cannot continue being irrelevant. You have to be of some good, either heavenly or earthly or both. But you cannot just live. Wewe tu ni oxygen unavuta. You just breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Year in, air out. 75 in Africa, you die and we bury you. You cannot be like that. Are we together? Are we together? So we are saying, number two, Abraham entered into new promises. So I want you to think you've come from a, an environment where there's premature death. Where people start things and they don't finish. Where people, others are irrelevant. They are just breathing in and out. 
That is all they, they are known for. That they breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Then they just live. They wake up every morning. But they are, they are not relevant. They are of no use. They are of no relevance. Then God calls you out. And then this is, then even before you leave, this is what God is telling you. Abram was entering into new promises. And we see that in verse 2 to 3. I want to summarize. I don't want us to read the scripture, but I want us to summarize. Uh, Abram was given seven the promises were seven. The first one, I will make you into a great nation. And last Sunday we were saying, this person who is being told, they will be made into a great nation. The wife is. So there was no hope. The word of God says he had a wife, the wife was Sarai, but the wife was barren. So that means if God had, I mean, if Abraham had not obeyed God, when God told him, come out and come and I will take you to a land, I will show you. If he had not begun to walk with God, he would not have gotten, uh, I mean, her womb would never have been opened. And that's why I'm saying God was calling Abram so that he can change his trajectory. So when God is calling us to a closer walk, you do not know what it is God is calling you out of. You do not know what it is God wants to change in your life. So he's told I, I mean, you're telling a man whose wife is barren, who is 75 years, that I will make you into a great nation. The second thing he was told, I will bless you. Now, this was not a poor man. He was not what? He was not a poor man. And that play tells you Blessing is not, and we, we, I think in this, we've already learned about the blessing. Blessing is not physical things. Because you are seeing when they leave, were well, we told what they carried? Are we told? Yes, we are told in, in chapter 12. We are told, Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered. And people whom they had acquired in Haran. That means they had slaves. They had servants. Why would you employ slaves and servants if you do not have work for them? Were they employing them for the sake? It means they were, they had work to do. That means he had, I mean, I want to believe he had animals. He had cattle. He had sheep. He had goats. He had camels. And that is why he needed workers. So, God was, when God is telling him, when he, God is telling him the things he's going to do in his life, he's, when he's telling him, I will bless you, it was not possessions. Because if it was possessions, he had them. Are we together? Number gapi? Number, number three now. I will make your name great. Do you remember irrelevance? For God to be telling him that I will make your name great. It is because he knew the family you are coming from has a lot of irrelevance. But now I want to come and I want to change your trajectory and I want to make your name great. Number four, you shall be a blessing. Do you remember God telling him I will bless you? But then now, now he's coming and saying, I will not just bless you, but you will be a blessing. So that means I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. So he gets relevance by, with a great name. But then he's also getting relevance in the sense of he's being what? A blessing. He's touching another life. He's not just living his life. He's not just living for himself. He's not just living for his wife and his children. I mean, and, and all who are called by him. He is 
becoming relevant because he's going to touch another person. And that is why it is saying, you shall be a blessing. You do not become a blessing to trees. You do not become a blessing to animals. You become a blessing to fellow human beings. Number five. I will bless those who bless you. That means he was going to enjoy the blessing of God and also the blessing of men. And that's why God is saying, I will bless those who do what? That means the blessings he was going to get were not just from Jehovah God, but they were also from other people. Number six, I will curse him who curses you. That means God was going to be defending him and fighting his enemies on his behalf. Because by the time God is coming to curse somebody because they have cursed you, you will not, that means God was telling Abraham, you will not even have to open your mouth to deal with your enemies. You will not even have to open your mouth to curse your enemies. It is me who will do it. I will curse him who curses you. And number seven, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You're coming from a place where your family, what one of the things that plagues your family is irrelevance. And then all of a sudden, you are becoming a global blessing. None of your contracts. Are you seeing the, the, the difference? You're coming from a place where people in your family or your family lineage, there is irrelevance. And then all of a sudden, you are becoming a global, a global blessing. That means he was, was being, he knew all the families of the earth will be blessed. Number three, we are, we are, we are, we are looking at Abram. What was the third thing that was happening to him when God called him to leave and come and I will show you. So that coming and I will show you, it meant God was calling Abraham close because he needed to be close to God so that God can show him. You can't show somebody who is at a distance. Are we together? Number three. He was entering into an assignment. And we already dealt with this last Sunday. What was the assignment? He was supposed to create or become the father of a great nation. And that is the nation we finally call, finally is called later in the word of God, the Hebrew people. So when we have the children of Israel... Being, I mean, being taken into captivity into Babylon, we normally refer to the three Hebrew boys. That was the family that Abraham began. There's something I want us to think about. When God, are you seeing this? I, I, I hope there's something you're seeing. That when God comes to call Abraham and tells him he wants to have a close walk with him and where the journey began so that in the end we can hear Abraham being referred to as the friend of God. There's something I want you to realize. He never came to Abraham because Abraham was perfect. We've looked at where. That's where had to, we had to go back and see where was he actually coming from. Was he coming from a perfect, was he perfect himself? No. He was not even coming from a perfect background. We've looked at his father. We've looked at his, bro I mean his brothers. We've looked at the environment they were living in. There is nothing good about it. Yet this is the person God comes and tells, live and come. I will take you I will, to a land I will show you. He's not even being called by God because everything is in place. Everything is not in place. 
Nothing was perfect about Abraham. And that is where most of us are. Many times we disqualify ourselves because we are waiting for everything to fall in place. Some of you, uh, we are talking about walking with God, but you are there saying, I mean, until I get a husband. So what are you waiting for? The husband, so that you can begin to walk closely to God. Others are waiting for a wife, so that you can begin to walk with God. We have all these things that we have said until this happens. And I've been getting amused. There's a meme that has been, I have seen on social media once in a while of this lady. I think, I think it's a lady or ladies who are saying they are waiting to get married so that they can settle. Huh? But the people who want to marry them are waiting for them to get settled so that they can So that tells you, the wait will be, it will be a long one. That waiting will be what? It will be a long one. In other words, I'm trying to tell you, whatever reason you have, what those things you are waiting for, for them to fall in place, so that you can now walk with God. Let me tell you, those are lies. Years ago, I'm talking about like, could be about 30 years ago, 30 or so years ago. A friend of ours said, as I told you, most of us who were young, we, I mean, who, who, who had grown up in the youth, we were all thinking about serving God. We were all, our hearts were sold out for God. And what we really wanted was to serve God. One day he opened his mouth and he said, he is not serving God until he gives him his first million. Until he gives him his what? 30, fast forward 30 years later, the million has never come. The, I have no record of the guy ever serving God. I even doubt whether he is even in the kingdom. And that man who said that lost his wife, not in death. His marriage didn't work. And he lost his two sons. There are some things you don't tell God that until the day you give me your first million, my first million, I am not serving you. And he said it with a lot of arrogance. Eh? And then God showed him, you will know you don't know. And I think today, Anaju Ahaju, Ahajui. Years later, his wife got married to another man and of course went with the son. With the sons. So he lost his wife. He lost his children. They are now part of another family. All because of opening up his mouth in arrogance. I will never, I will, I will serve God the day he will give me his first million. I remember another very, very sad story. Uh, for Pasi and I and many of us, I mean many of the people who to date remain our friends. To date are serving God and are doing exploits for God. We, our hearts were completely sold out. In those days, we never even served God because we had prophetic words of our lives. But I remember this guy, the church where he was serving, he was already an elder. By the time he was an elder, me and Pasi were nothing. But we were serving God, sold out. We had actually begun a church. Because we began a church the year we got married. And of course, the church was out of evangelism. I think that was the second or the third church that Pastor Mwigai was planting. And this guy had a prophetic word in one of the conferences back then, those years. I'm talking of over 30 years ago. He had a prophetic word that he's going to be one of the greatest evangelists in East Africa. So around 30, I mean around 30 years ago, the prophetic word had come maybe like, I would say maybe like 35 years ago. Then around 30 years ago, the guy decides to go south, to South Africa. And I used to be very, very concerned of, about this family because they had everything in place to be able to serve God. 
1998, Laisa was five, Shiro was one year. We decided to go and visit them in South Africa. Me, I just had one question. Those of you who know me, I, I'm very good at asking questions. I had just one question. I remember, I think it was the night before we left. We sat down with this couple and we were asking them, do you have a very clear prophetic word over your lives? This was a graduate. He was doing so well. But in that pursuit for money, you get, eh? Mutakayote? In that pursuit of money, in wanting money, I remember South Africa had just opened up and it was pressure. Uh, one of the things I think that moved him that there was pressure. So on this night, I sat down with them and I was asking them, you have a very clear prophetic word in your, in, over your life that you're going to be an evangelist in East Africa. What are you doing in South Africa? What are you doing? And this is what the wife said. We have come here to make a lot of money because we don't want to start ministry and struggle. Huh? We want to get all the money we need to be, what, to be able to do what? To start what? Ministry. Now, as I've always told you, over the years, I loved reading biographies of men and women of God. How I know people, how I know how people have started churches. Hakuna script in Anzanga Ivo. And those of you who've worked with God for some time, have you ever had anybody who began church because they had all the money they need? Money for equipment, money for seats, money for the hall, money for everything. Those were her exact words. And I told her, well, I may be wrong, but according to the little I know, and the little I have studied the men and women of God, nobody starts ministry. That's not how you start ministry. You don't start ministry because you have money. And then there is no script that you start ministry and you do not struggle. Fast forward. They never began any ministry. They never did what? The marriage ended. The marriage did what? Why? Wait, because they were waiting for everything to fall in so that now they can begin to walk with. They, not that they were born again, yes. We are talking about a walk, a close walk with God because God has identified you and said, I want to walk closely with you. But you have every reason why you will not walk closely with God. You always have an excuse, a sweet one for that matter. The good thing is that I know they are still believers. But I look at their life. And to me it is a sad one. I see an aborted destiny. Purposes of God over their lives were aborted. They had everything going for them. But because of their, what do, do we call them? Excuses? Tulizita nini? Sababu na? Sababu na? They always have an excuse. But we are looking at Abraham. Not everything was in place. And if you are going to walk with God, stop giving the excuses. I am waiting for business is stabilized. I am waiting nipate kazi. I am waiting to get a husband. I am waiting to get a wife. I am waiting and you are waiting and you are waiting and you are waiting. And as we have seen about the ladies who are waiting to get married so that they can settle down and the people who want to marry them are waiting for them to settle down so that they can marry them. The waiting will, you will wait and in the end you will not end up working with God. Are we together? Are we together? So let's stop giving the excuses. Abraham was coming from a lot of imperfection. 
Because God wanted to change his trajectory. I want us to look at uh, one or two other examples very quickly. We won't read the scriptures. The other person I want us to think about is Jacob. And I want you to think about Genesis 28. Jacob calls his brother of the birthright. And of course, he ends up being blessed by Isaac in place of Esau. And of course, after he's blessed, his father tells him to leave and go. And when he goes, even though he's a fugitive, he has just conned his brother of the blessing. Remember earlier, he had conned him of the birthright. But even in that state, he's able to encounter God. Remember where he goes and he takes a stone and he's sleeping on the stone. And then he begins to see a vision. And then he says, Kumbe God was here, yet I did not know him. And from that point, he began a walk with God. And if you follow the story, even when, no wonder even when he's, he's, he's in Laban's house, he's still having a walk with God. And if you follow that walk with God, later, God is able to deal with the things that were wrong in his life. When he wrestled, when he's coming back from uh, his uncle's place and he wrestled with the angel and the angel asks him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Jacob. And then God was able to sort out the things that were in his life. Are we together? So read Genesis 28. If you can read from verse 10 to 22. I want us to look at another example. This is a story of soul. God doesn't call you for a, to a close walk with him. Because everything is in place. Because everything is perfect. You could be having as many flaws. But those are the ones that God wants to deal with. And he decides, I want to walk with you. This is a very interesting one. Uh, Acts chapter 9 verse 1 to 16 says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for uh, letters from him to the synagogues of ja Damascus, so that if he found any who are of the way, um, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so he journeyed, he came to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Lord, who are you? Uh, and he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gods. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise, go to the city and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, uh, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him uh, by the hand and brought him to, into da Damascus. And he was three days without sight and, without, uh, and neither ate nor drank. Verse 10. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And so the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tatars. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he was, he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Saul was a persecutor of the, of the church. But, I mean, apart from that, what was he? Huh? No, what was he? Within the church. He was something within the church. He was a Pharisee. So we are not talking about Saul, a devil worshiper. We are not talking about a Freemason. We are talking about somebody who was in church. Thinking he is serving God, 
Let me tell you, as he killed these believers, he was actually doing it, quote unquote, on behalf of God. So he thought he was serving God. So he encounters God. And that is why this, when this Ananias is sent to him, he is like, how can you send him me to such a person? He's a very, very bad person. But I want you to listen to what God says, what the Lord tells him in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine. He's what? Very busy persecuting the Christians. Very busy killing everybody who was calling upon the name of the Lord. But as far as the Lord was concerned, he was a chosen vessel of mine. And we are still waiting for perfection. We are still waiting to be perfect so that we can offer and give ourselves to the Lord. Huh? Tell your neighbor, big lie. Tell your neighbor again, big lie. So verse 15 is saying, but the Lord said to him, go for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the, Gentile, the Gentiles, the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. God wanted to change the trajectory of soul. Because the way this trajectory was going, it was not in the right direction. Yes, he was in the church. Yes, he was a Pharisee. But his trajectory was not going in the right direction. And that's why he had to meet God so that God can change his trajectory. Change him into a completely different man so that he can become that vessel and that instrument that he wanted to use. Are we together? Are we together? So when we hear, when God is speaking to us and saying, I want a close walk with you. One of the things that God wants to do is to change your trajectory. When your trajectory changes, your image changes, your identity changes, your story changes. Amen? Amen. So let's stop giving the excuses. Let's stop delaying. Let's stop dragging our, our feet. Let's stop waiting for things to fall in place. The people we have looked at today, nothing was in place. Things, it is God as he changes your trajectory that will cause everything that you are expecting to fall in place to end up falling in place. Amen? Let's stand up. I want us to sing this song. Belen in Aendelea. Are we believing God that our trajectory is going to change? Are we believing God that the direction of our lives is going to change? It doesn't matter what family you are coming from. It, I mean, it could be a family. You know those kind of families where people say, can anything good come out of this family? We are saying that as we begin to walk closely with God, our trajectory will change. You could be the person that will bring change in that family because you have allowed yourself to walk closely with God. I want the worship team to lead us in that song. Belen in Aendelea. Belen in Aendelea.
God, we just want to thank you. We thank you for speaking to us, oh God. We thank you for our lives, oh God. We want to thank you because our lives are precious in your sight, oh God. And we thank you, oh God, that even as you're calling us to a closer walk with you, oh God, as you're calling us to journey with you, oh God, we thank you, oh God, because you, are, you know everything concerning our lives. Everything may not be in place, oh God. We may not be perfect. We may not be coming from perfect backgrounds, oh God. Everything that we have envisioned everything that we may be, have desired may not be in place oh God but we are saying like Abraham that we will obey that we will trust you oh God that when you say move we will move that when you say you want to walk with us oh God we will cooperate with you oh God and allow you to do that which you want to do in our lives today and Lord for Lord we just want to thank you we thank you because today oh God you are speaking to us oh God that you want to change our trajectory you want to change our identity you want to change our image you want to change things that may not be right things that may not be accurate in our lives oh God and therefore Lord even as we continue to journey with you oh God we are saying we will move on with you oh God we are saying we will trust you we will believe you oh God we will put our hope and our trust in you oh Oh God, even where we cannot trust you, where we cannot understand you, oh God, we are saying, oh God, that we want to continue to journey with you. We want to thank you and we want to bless you. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray and believe. Amen. Amen and amen. We may kindly have our seats. We want to request the, um, the ashes to wait on us. In the spirit of excellence, even as we give our offering, it is time to give. And uh, in this church, we give very consciously, we give very deliberately, and we give uh, willingly because God loves a cheerful giver. The pay bill number is on the screen. Uh, pay bill number 247247, account is 880812. And as we give, uh, the praise and worship team will minister to us in song. Take your glory, King of kings. Take your glory, Lord of lords. Take your glory. 